just a little bit about me. Uh, I worked here actually, my first horticulture job was a summer intern, 1982. I was a freshman at Maryland. I uh, grew up uh, down the road in Silver Spring, went to Springbrook High School. So I'm a, I'm a local native too. Um, uh, since that time, I've worked at the, the Botanic Garden uh, since 1986, literally uh, a couple months after graduating. So I've been there for a long time. Gardener for 19 years. I'm a gardener at heart. That's really what I want to do. Uh, but in 2005, we had a new position, uh, the first one that really tempted me, which was a uh, curator of plants. I applied for that and, re and received that job in 2005 uh, while I was working on, on helping build the National Garden, which is an outdoor three-acre site uh, adjacent to the conservatory. The heart of it is a native plant garden, and that's what I was interested in, but it also is a rose garden, a butterfly garden, an amphitheater, and a water feature. Uh, if you haven't been there, uh, it's really quite nice. My favorite time there is probably fall, and I'll show you why. Uh, so I've, I've been there quite a while. Uh, I'll, I oversee everything the, from orchids and dealing with orchid viruses, uh, tropicals and whatnot, so I've had to call on a lot of my uh, uh, old experience with house plants and whatnot uh, to do the whole job. All right, so let's start. Uh, Landscape for Life. Uh, I didn't put the logo on all my slides like Ray does. He's, he's good about that. Um, Native plants have become quite hot lately. I mean, you hear a lot about them. A lot of, a lot of nursery people are selling more native plants than they used to, which is great. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. There's also, I think, a little tiny bit of backlash. I hear a lot, see a lot on blogs and whatnot that uh, you know, people feel that they're being forced to, into it. Uh, I wanna make sure that you guys look at native plants and say, I wanna invite them into my garden because they're just so great. Uh, there's so many reasons. Uh, there are a lot of myths. A lot of, a lot of people plant natives in the landscape just thinking they're adapted, they'll do great, they're going to be easy, I won't really need to do anything once I put them in. Try to grow a pink lady slipper orchid. <laughs> you can't. There are native plants that are impossible to grow in the garden or very difficult or challenging. Uh, I like challenging plants. Uh, native pitcher plants got me interested as a kid. Um, and some of them are quite simple to grow, so th they run the whole gamut. Uh, the same thing with they're not very showy. Uh, it depends. If you want spectacular uh, hibiscus with flowers 10 inches across, we've got it. If you want something really subtle and demure for a woodland pathway, we have it. Uh, native plants can do it all. Uh, and you don't have to leave them alone. I really have a, a take issue with native plant gardens that started developing more about uh, 10 to 15 years ago. I'd visit some. I was at a Brook Green, I think, in South Carolina. Nice sculpture garden with beautiful grounds. And then you came to the native plant garden, and it was this big, whoof, you know, just a jungle. Uh, they let everything grow. They didn't seem to weed it, because they might have thought the weeds were native, too. Uh, to me, uh, that's fine if you're doing reclamation work, and you want a dense habitat for, for uh, nectaring and for larval hosting and whatnot. Uh, but we have some standards uh, in the suburbs and in our city gardens. We have to think about our neighbors. Uh, we, we do use our, our creative eye to create gardens that are inviting, and so we, we need to compromise. Um, they actually do support an entire native food web, and that's uh, not just butterflies. Everything from microflora and fauna in the soil, uh, which really is the life of a garden, to all the things that fly around and crawl around and fly around like birds. Uh, so they're, they're really plugged in, and that's something that not many non-native plants can claim. Uh, regionally local natives don't contribute to invasiveness. I, I want to make clear when you use the word invasive, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, like lobbing a Molotov cocktail sometimes. People go, well, I have a native plant and it's invasive. It's, it's, if it's locally native, it's not invasive, it's a, it can be aggressive. And that might not be a great garden plant. I don't, I don't recommend a lot of native plants as garden plants. I would put them into uh, reclamation work for roadsides where an aggressive plant is a great thing to have. But again, we need to pick and choose somewhat. Uh, and they're durable or delicate, bold or subtle, you'll see uh, as the talk goes on. This is a typical kind of new housing development. This is a one in Delaware near where my parents have retired. And you can see, you know, just the, the typical kind of sterile lawn. Uh, yeah, there we go. Not supporting much at all. A uh, few trees, and this lot that hasn't been developed yet, probably that's a real happy place for 
uh, skippers and other small butterflies and, and, and some life, uh, we need to compromise a little bit here. Um, uh, when I think about lawns and the amount of time we spend grooming them, uh, I grew up uh, down the road, like I say, on New Hampshire Avenue. We had a lot of large oak and hickory trees in the yard. We kind of gave up on grass. I, I was really lucky that I grew up in a household where my mom said, you know what, if it's green, who cares, just cut it, just so it's not too tall. So we had moss and we had violets and we had probably some things that weren't native like plantain, but uh, there was variety. These violet patches are kind of dense. I don't recommend this as a garden plant because it's a, it seeds so heavily. But the fritillary butterfly, she lays her eggs on the ground around violets and the, the hatchlings have to crawl to a plant. There's a reason why that, that butterfly can lay them on the ground because violets tend to make dense patches. That's the way it's supposed to be. If you can spare a little area on the edge of your property and just let some violets go, you'll, you'll be doing a good thing. And I think they're kind of pretty. Uh, this is my bicycle commute to work uh, at Oxen Hill last year. Um, we, just, we really need to think about the ways in which we s set gardens up to demand extreme amounts of water. It really just doesn't make sense to, to, to put woody plants uh, along a tiny strip. They actually chose a native plant, an aronia, uh, and so I think it's kind of sad that they also have to water it continually. Uh, and this is a big, big topic now, and one I, I get more and more involved with over time, invasive plants. So these are plants uh, we would generally define as not having been here prior to European colonization. Um, we don't know exactly what happened before that time. Uh, and so lots of plants have come onto our land for, in all different ways. Uh, this one came as packing material for plates that were sent, I think, to Kentucky or Tennessee. Tennessee. Pardon? Tennessee. Tennessee, thanks. 1919. Oh, excellent. Oh, you know your stuff. All right, come on. Up. Come on. <laughs> uh, I took this picture at Oxen Hill Farm, which is sad because it's just uh, covering what it seems like acres of ground. It's an annual grass, so the packing material was nice and light. It was heaped out as compost probably, and the, the seeds went loose, and that was that. Uh, so uh, the bad thing about this, it makes such a thorough, dense carpet so it physically excludes things. And the, another bad piece of news for us is uh, deer don't eat it. And so with the overpopulation of deer, which is really similar to problems we'll see with invasive vines, it's all about edge habitats. Uh, it's a kind of a double-edged sword here. So this plant is being favored because the deer will choose anything but it. Um, calorie pears are an unfortunate example of a plant that was brought here as an ornamental uh, it was this, the, the Bradford pear was released by the Arboretum and some of the people there will say it was their worst mistake ever. Uh, is, is it true that Maryland is looking at banning? Uh, Prince George's did. The county did, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. We always wait till wait, you know, way too late, but it, it, it's meaningful to other people in other areas and I think it's helpful in the long run. Um, so th this one was, was released as a semi-sterile cultivar but it was found to have branching problems. It would break up too early. So people came out with new varieties. And the more unrelated germplasm you have out there, the more pollination happens, the more seed gets set, and voila, we had a problem. Suddenly Bradford's setting fruit, Aristocrat and Cleveland Select and White Spire and all the other ones that have come after set uh, heavy crops of fruit that birds distribute. Uh, and now I think on Route 50, both on the Fairfax County side and the uh, Prince George of Santa Arundel side, it's the dominant tree uh, along roadsides. Um, and it really doesn't give back. There's, it's wonderfully, uh, it's a good landscape plant and on one hand because nothing eats it, but think about that. Now it's gotten out of control. It's not in your yard where it needs to be perfect and it's not feeding anything. Uh, Norway maple, more of a problem in the northern states. Uh, again, another one that's brought as an ornamental, makes really dense shade. Uh, its mechanism of invasiveness is, a, is, of course, heavy seeding like a lot, but it adds in uh, another aspect, which is uh, allelopathy, a chemical means of suppressing other plants. Uh, Norway maple is also more problematic up north, and there's a lot of thought going into the fact that earthworms, which are also not native, 
have invaded woodlands in the Northeast. They love maple leaves more than something like oak because they're soft and easily digested. They can drag them down into their holes. Uh, as earthworms feed, they actually bump the pH of the soil up a little bit. And this is a calcified plant, so it's benefiting, benefiting and so they kind of do this cycle thing together. Uh, Lanicera macchiae is the one shrub that actually got me involved in a local program to remove invasive plants from a, a park between two schools where I live. I, I'm just amazed. I got a dog several years ago and my neighbors all said, take her on a walk up uh, on this path between the schools. You'll love it because you love nature. Uh, so I, I come back from my walk and I have a scowl on my face. And they're like, what's wrong? And I said, oh, no, it was okay. Well, didn't you like it? it was so, it's so green. I said, yeah. Everything in there is non-native except the trees. There was ivy climbing up the trees. Uh, there's bush honeysuckle. I would bet you that in urban areas, this is by far the most numerous single shrub, bar none. There are probably no native shrub can outnumber it. It's just gotten that out of hand. Um, it was originally brought for bird food for its berries uh, and also as an ornamental. It limbs up over time and it's fairly attractive. You won't find it for sale much anymore. Um, it, it is possible because it's not illegal to sell it in most states. Um, the bad thing is its fruit are very watery. They're not highly nutritious. Birds will consume it in huge quantities uh, and, and distribute the seed. But for our migrating birds, it's apparently not such a good thing. They really need our high oil content seeds to make their migration successfully. Uh, ones like this, Linicera uh, tetarica, are still for sale, and also I think Linicera fragrantissima, fragrantissima uh, sweet breath, breath of spring. They're all easy to grow shrubs, uh, but the fact that they fruit so readily is actually a problem. Uh, the poster child of uh, herbaceous plants, this is another garden escape, uh, Lythrum. Um, the reason I'm putting it here, uh, this is a long four mile run in Arlington, uh, Alexandria on the other side. Uh, it wasn't really there when I moved there many years ago. I saw one or two and now it just lines the entire waterway. Um, I watched it do the same thing in the Anacostia uh, where our nursery used to be. Um, it seeds very heavily, it outcompetes native plants. Uh, what's interesting about this one is it was so bad up in the Great Lakes that they finally got around to introducing uh, a couple of predatory weevils. Um, the risk in doing that is we also have native loose strife in the same genus, very closely related. Uh, Lithrum elatum is actually quite a pretty one. Um, so the, the testing was to see whether or not the weevil would transition once it's done with this one to our native ones. And they found in, in laboratory conditions that, they, that the weevil would not. So there's been some success. There's been some predation of the seeds and the plants, and there's been some success up north um, on that one. Uh, garlic mustard is a great one to bring up um, because it's related to native mustards. If you know in the woods, uh, toothworts, uh, dentaria they, was the old genus name. I used to, you know, used to dig them up as a kid because they tasted like horseradish. Um, this one is prevalent in all local woods. Uh, not so bad here, except that it outcompetes everything like other invasive plants, but just going a little bit west into Virginia and West Virginia, and it is a false larval sink for the West Virginia white butterfly. So it's a native butterfly, used to be very, very common, but where this thing has taken over woods, the female lays her eggs on it, it smells like the native mustard, but her larvae are poisoned by it, they starve to death. So that butterfly has gone from extremely common to quite uncommon in 10 years. Um, so it's, its distribution is moving further west uh, and, the, and the garlic mustard is chasing it. So th that's a really a great visceral example. Uh, vines, for the same reason that um, uh, uh, deer are so prevalent now, we've chopped up our habitats into these small little pieces everywhere. We have little woods. We all want to live with the woods backing our house, right? I mean, what could be better? Uh, unfortunately, that disturbance along the edge opens up a uh, habitat for lots of invasive plants. Uh, vines among them, but I'll, I'll add in that even native vines are becoming problematic now. A lot of native grapes, uh, poison ivy, uh, are also pretty aggressive vines or large scale plants. Uh, they have so many habitats now that they'll actually sort of work on the outside of the woods and sort of collapse it from the outside in. Uh, Oriental bittersweet really bad in this area, and it seems to be kind of a specialist in taking trees down. It's more efficient than some other vines. Uh, 
Uh, still widely sold. We do have a native uh, species in the mountains, uh, and I have many times bought it, fruited it, and it turns out to be this. So a lot of nurserymen don't, don't really know what they have. Um, Got to work with people that, that care. Uh, this is one that's still commonly sold. I loved this vine when I was a kid. Uh, it smells wonderful in the autumn. This is, uh, it used to be Clematis, I think, Paniculata. It's had a couple different name changes over time. Uh, but sweet autumn, Clematis, really, really bad along waterways. You can definitely see it if you're taking the beltway up 295 uh, into DC, uh, uh, all along the Oxen Cove. Uh, very aggressive, 40 to 50 feet tall, uh, semi-evergreen, and this is something a lot of invasive plants have uh, in common too. They tend to have extended foliar seasons. They leaf out early, and they keep their foliage late, so we're thinking that that gives them a little competitive edge. They, they can just do that much more photosynthesizing. Uh, this one, the seeds travel on wind and water, uh, and so in this case, it's really interrupting a, what would be a, an incredibly productive habitat for, for the critters. Uh, and of course, porcelain berry vine, uh, it just, it's sort of the kudzu of the mid-Atlantic. Uh, we have kudzu here too. Um, it's disturbing for me to go, I think I was at Merrifield Nursery a few weeks ago and see a cut leaf variety, a variegated variety, and a new yellow leaf variety uh, in the market, all still legally sold. Uh, I don't care what people say about uh, America being regulatory. We are not a very regulatory country. We don't like it. We don't like someone telling us what we can and cannot buy. Uh, but this is the, the flip side of that. Uh, and of course, I think the, the worst of the worst. Uh, English ivy, incredibly bad on the East Coast and the West Coast. Super destructive because it, it has two growth phases, the juvenile, which creeps along the ground and smothers everything. Uh, it makes a very, very dense cover, uh, and it's evergreen. Then it climbs up trees. It hits an uh, 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 adult form where it, it shrubs out, and then it starts fruiting. Uh, the birds take the seeds. Apparently the seed is not really great for our native birds. It makes them a little sick. Uh, Non-native birds will eat it, uh, but uh, they basically excrete the seed extra fast because it's not that great for them. Uh, so they're, this is a bad one. Uh, still, of course, commonly sold. I think I saw flats at Merrifield, 35 bucks a piece, and people are buying them. Uh, if you did, did have something like this in your yard, if you could keep it in a really confined island and not let it creep, not so bad. Uh, I usually help people try to replace it entirely with not just one native because there's never like one exact substitute for a plant like this. It's a variety. That's what you need to do. Uh, and people that say, I really need to, I need it on that slope because I don't want it to erode. Uh, dry brown leaves will do just as well to keep erosion down. Uh, and this is just a, an open area. Nature hates a vacuum. This is under a power line cut in Columbia, Maryland. That's where my brother lives. So I go, we walk around Century Lake or something like that near where he lives. And uh, that's a, that jumble is what our native insects and, and other things are looking for in an open sunny area. But in among there, there might be some plants that are good garden plants and some that are too aggressive to recommend as garden plants. Uh, at the National Garden, uh, we have a, a sloped garden. It's actually higher on the sides and low in the middle. So we did a right plant, right place concept. I actually uh, decontented the planned irrigation system for the garden so the gardeners aren't happy with me. Uh, they have to water with a hose, just like you do. Um, my problem with the irrigation system is, is they're misused. They'll tell you that they want it just for emergency situations, and then you see the schedule for it to come on at you know, 5 to 7 a.m. every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday or whatever. Um, so our garden uh, becomes a labor of love. Uh, it's in the middle of the city, uh, technically zone eight now. Um, and we did indeed plant things that like more moisture, like you know, river birches <coughs> towards the center, uh, that's a bald cypress, and then dry land trees on the elevated edges. And that's kind of the whole concept of, of landscape for life. Uh, what I did when I was specking the plants for that garden is I, I paid attention to the geology, the plant's natural range, whether they were obligate wetland plants, facultative plants, meaning they grow either wet or dry, or upland plants that really are, that like well-drained ground. Uh, I chose a range for that garden from New Jersey through North Carolina, uh, respecting our zone 7-8 status. And going a little further south, it also pulls in a pretty neat 
coastal plain of flora. I like my Venus flytraps. Um, we are on the fall line, so essentially the, the, the native garden there is a fall line garden. So we have that the line of towns from Trenton actually would go down to Alabama, Georgia to Alabama. Uh, that is the line separating the Piedmont to the west, and we all know the, the clay Piedmont soils, gravelly, rocky clay, and then the coastal plain, which is really, I think, it, obvious when we say cross the Bay Bridge, but the coastal plain actually starts right in the, in the heart of, of DC. Um, it's just that the, the clay is kind of sloughed off to the east over time. The Appalachian Mountains used to be the size of the Himalayas, so they've weathered down over time uh, eastward, both by uh, water action, uh, so that's erosion, uh, but also uh, the coastal plain butting up against it was formed in layers from that, and then marine deposits kind of receding and going back and forth over eons. So the land here in the coastal plain is very young, one or two million years, where the Appalachians are super complicated, and geologists, it's sort of their holy grail. There's stuff that's 30, 40 million plus years old. Um, what I did was I used things like, like uh, plant atlases. Virginia has an atlas. Maryland does not have a dot atlas to tell you what county a plant occurs in. It's the only state that doesn't. <laughs> so when you, when, you use this, oops, when you use this wonderful website, uh, uh, USDA's plants.gov website, uh, you won't find Maryland's distribution. And since Maryland was included in my garden, I would have to look at Virginia and Pennsylvania and kind of figure it out. It, you, could, you could see the patterns of distribution pretty clearly. But what you'll find is that some plants are really married to one area or another. In Virginia, this species obviously seems to like coastal plain soil. So I put it in an area that has sandy, well-drained, maybe acidic soil. Uh, some other species might be uh, largely confined to scattered populations in mountains. Uh, and so I would have to do a little more research. If I found that its distribution stopped in the high mountains, I'm like, hmm, it's not going to like our zone eight summers in the city. So I excluded mountain flora uh, from the garden. Uh, and I saw original plant lists, including things like bog rosemary from Greenland. Uh, not a good plant for DC. Um, Anyway, that's a great website. I also really like NatureServe's website. It's, it's also about animals, not just uh, plants. But they do some color coding that's very helpful. So you'll know, uh, for instance, if a, a, what the distribution is. If it's in brown, it means that it's in the state, but the state hasn't given an official status for how rare or common it is. Uh, it looks like it's secure in Virginia and maybe uh, a little bit rare in North Carolina. It's a, a, a particular aster. Uh, and then a non-native plant has a completely different color, so you can quickly see, and I, I can find this iris at nurseries sold as a native plant, the big yellow water iris, definitely not native, very, very aggressive plant. Uh, but there's its this distribution in the U.S., and that, again, is from being uh, used as an ornamental. Uh, so nature serve. Um, let's look at some of the plants. I'm starting in spring with some things. Now, when you think of native plants, you tend to think woodland wildflowers. Everyone wants, you know, the Virginia bluebells and the blood roots and whatnot. Our garden is so new and kind of hot, we have not that many of those spring ephemerals, so it's more heavy on the meadow plants. Um, there are plants that are thought of as woodland wildflowers, but they're really not. You can find these two, uh, bird's foot violet and the Silene caroliniana, uh, the catchfly, uh, Great Falls. I was hiking along the falls when we were at high flood stage this year and found both of these. So they actually like well-drained ground, not too much shade, they'll take full sun, uh, very drought tolerant, and if you let them go in an open environment without lots of mulch and TLC, they'll seed around a bit, which would be very welcome. Uh, a little bit more shade tolerant for sure are things like Aquilegia, the um, uh, native columbine, early food for migrating hummingbirds coming up from South America, uh, and well known and a very nice rock garden plant. Uh, and then Chrysogonum virginianum. This one's gotten more and more popular in the trade for good reason. It's got a very long bloom season for a perennial. Uh, it can bloom on and off at least through uh, early summer, so spring uh, to midsummer. Um, uh, also, it will seed modestly, but only say in, a, in like a gravelly situation. It really doesn't want the heavy mulch, all the organic stuff. A lot of our native plants are tough. Uh, and I decided in my front yard, instead of battling all the time, a dry, hot, sunny yard, uh, to give up and grow plants that are appropriate and stop hauling the hose out you know, every other day. 
Uh, these are good plants for those kinds of gardens. Uh, in the genus like Phlox, which is a very American genus, you have it all from uh, early spring bloomers like Phlox nivalis. Uh, that's a more southern and coastal plain species than the more common Phlox subulata, which is moss Phlox. Now, I don't know, growing up in this area, I remember like my parents driving us out to um, uh, up Brightwood Dam or something. You'd see in the spring people selling boxes of Phlox subulata in all the most clashing colors right next to each other. And, but they're native, so they're good. <laughs> uh, woodland Phlox is another one that's great uh, because it looks so much better in your garden. Uh, it looks beautiful in the wild, but it's very sort of sparse. When it gets a little garden care, it actually becomes a wonderful plant, and that's sort of true of all the Phlox. Uh, and that's a, a native form of uh, local Phlox Pan paniculata. You can find lots of fancy color forms of it, but they'll tend to be weaker and maybe have powdery mildew issues. Um, I just like the good old magenta color. Um, and here we have two plants together in the National Garden uh, blooming mid-spring. Uh, the yellow one, Coreopsis verticillata, probably pretty familiar. Uh, readily available in the garden centers. Usually as a cultivar, you can, like Moonbeam is pale yellow and uh, there's, there's lots of others. Uh, that's a form that I collected wild in North Carolina. And then along with it is this uh, penstemon, the purple. Uh, for some reason, you can't buy that at a local nursery. There's no reason for that. It's a great plant. It's easy to grow, uh, blooms well. Uh, you can cut it after it blooms and get an extended season out of it. Uh, but a lot of native plants still, you've got to go to especially mail order companies to find them. Uh, and this is one worth seeking out. Bumblebees just love it. Uh, again, like the, the showy part, we have hibiscus. I mean, what could be more showy than that? Um, I pass through swamps on my bike commute every day, and it's just wonderful to see huge swaths of them on the uh, Virginia side and Prince George's County side. Uh, ours just happened to be from uh, me popping off the bike trail and making such collections. Uh, so we have, uh, oops, we have, uh, uh, I think, the hibiscus lavis uh, I collected in the Fairfax County, this one also. Uh, and then the mosquitoes in Prince George's County. So a lot of our plants are actually locally collected germplasm. That's a pretty mean feat. I, I, when, when you go to search for native plants, that's an extra layer of difficulty, but uh, in some cases, it can make a difference in how well something grows. Um, and these are the basis of the fancy hybrids that you find. Uh, there's one more southern species that's red that's used in a lot of them, but uh, great plants, much loved. I think there are bumblebees. There's a bumblebee down in there. Uh, very, very favored by pollinators. So easy to grow. It's a wetlander, but it's used to our summer droughts, so that makes it a, a superb garden plant. Uh, from the same kind of habitat, uh, plants like Verbena hastata that aren't too well known, uh, that form a light purple haze uh, in wet sloughs, uh, and also Senna hebocarpa and its counterpart in the south, Senna Mar marilandica. Uh, the wild Senna is really stately, garden plants. They're deep rooted, so even though they're kind of a wetland thing, they've got the constitution to take some summer drying and it'll take a good, good drought to wilt them at all and they'll still bounce right back. <coughs> Both of them great, great pollinator plants. And we see coming in on Maryland state flower, uh, a little tiny hoverfly, and of course that's one of our native pollinators, but what's so great about growing a variety, and you see some little native grasses around it, the more textures that you bring in, the more of these tiny solitary pollinators you get. And this hoverfly, uh, if you look closely, is not only going for all the tiny little flowers packed into that flower head, but there's uh, an aphid sitting there. And what's wonderful about these pollinators is once she's collected some, some tasty high protein pollen, uh, she's going to scour that plant and find where the, the aphids are located underneath the stem and she's going to lay her eggs and her larvae consume aphids. So bringing beneficials into the garden is about variety, bring a, a variety of plants together. Uh, and lots of small flowers seem to be uh, great for, for just doing that. Uh, this is Euphorbia correlata. How many folks have it in their garden? <coughs> exactly. I don't get it. It's, I saw it wild with my brother in Columbia. Uh, it grows in fields. It gets three, four feet tall. Uh, but it's one of those great plants that when it comes up about this tall, I'll sometimes cut it shorter and it'll bloom at a shorter height. You can kind of customize it. Great long bloom season, no kidding. It's, it's blooming from June to November. 
It's a fantastic plant, kind of like a native, native uh, baby's breath. You won't find it in nurseries because in its first one to two years, it's a really spindly looking seedling. It's not real impressive. It would be hard to see it flying off the shelves. And that's, that's kind of the tough thing about a lot of our native plants. Uh, but so easy, if you were to obtain seed or young plants, you'll have them forever. And no watering necessary. Uh, and I, I'm ki not kidding, my uh, hose bib broke at my house for three years and I was too lazy to get it fixed. So what survived, survived, and that was one of the tough ones. Uh, this Eryngium, probably not grown much, although I know a lady in Potomac that has it. Um, uh, a lot of the Eryngiums are Sea Hollies or Mediterranean, but we have our own natives as well. And this is a marsh plant, but it does great in gardens. Uh, blooms in the late summer and fall, and just a wonderful bouquet. Lots and lots of pollinators coming in on that. And you can see it in our National Garden. Um, it's funny, if you're into butterflies, and I kind of more recently got into it, you'll see that for the black swallowtail, the recommended host plants, fennel, dill, parsley, da 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 da, nothing native. So how the heck did the butterfly make it here before we grew gardens? So of course, <laughs> there are lots of native plants in the carrot family. Uh, so this is one of them, water parsnip. It grows in marshes. I wouldn't highly recommend it as a garden plant. It kind of looks like Queen Anne's lace, but it needs a pretty wet site, and it's aggressive by seed. But we do have something like Zizia aurea, the golden Alexanders, uh, growing in semi-shade in, in local woods. It makes a great garden plant, and it's just as good a larval host for the, the swallowtail. Um, most people are familiar with milkweeds uh, in our area. There's a particular subspecies of the swamp milkweed, and so mine and the garden are from Anne Arundel County, but they're the same ones I see locally. Uh, so it's a little bit fuzzier leaf than the form you'll find in garden centers. The butterfly doesn't really care. Um, they love it for nectaring, and that's, it, it is the favored larval host for the monarch. Wonderful for moist to average gardens. If you don't have a lot of moisture, you want something like Asclepius tuberosus, a great local native, loves it dry, hot, and sunny, does not like mulch, does not want overhead water. I think that's a great plant. Um, ours at the garden, by the way, are I think from Talbot County, Maryland, and that's because we grow so many of them as garden plants, but most of the seed is of a Midwestern subspecies, and I was trying really hard to get the, the true locally native form. Uh, it looks pretty much the same, and the butterflies definitely think so. It's good. Um, Rebecca Lucindigata, what I want to talk about a little bit here is when you're choosing native plants, um, you're going to see a lot of cultivated forms out there. You know how, that, how it's gone with Echinacea. It's gone from the little, the purple Echinacea purpurea to now double forms, yellow, white, all these different colors. I don't really have a problem with most of those. Uh, they're, they're pretty good. But this single flowered plant has some benefits uh, for your pollinators. That cone at the top, that cone is uh, very uh, firm, and so it's a good hold place for the, the feet of something like a butterfly, and later, when the seeds produce, goldfinches will be able to hang on to that. When you get into really dense double flowers, you're limiting, even if there is nectar down in there, the number and type of pollinators that, that will visit, because their proboscis has to be long enough to get all the way down in there. So single flowers preferred. Uh, and sometimes you're going to have to make a decision. Of, uh, uh, we're trying to do this at the uh, National Garden. We had a lot of ground to cover when we first went in there. So a kind of aggressive seed plant like Salvia lyrata was OK with me at first. Now I'm starting to think, gee, you know, we're not so good at, at deadheading it. I was about to have it all removed. And then I went out there with my camera that day to photograph something else. And lo and behold, uh, a big swarm of goldfinches comes in on it, and I decided to defer my decision <laughs> one more year. <laughs> but uh, that's up to you. It's depending on how tidy or, or loose you are with your gardening style. Um, if you really need neatness, here's a wonderful native plant. This used to be called Maryland Dittany, uh, but it's now called Common Dittany or Wild Oregano. This is a real great dryland plant. It grows in rocky places, and it's, it remains kind of an 8 by 8 tuft. And then it blooms in the uh, late summer to fall. Uh, wonderful minty fragrance when you rub it. Bees and other pollinators can't stay off of it. Makes a fine tea. It's actually been used as an herbal tea or a flavoring. Uh, and it's got a weird thing in the fall after the stems have died. They keep pushing tiny bits of moisture out and they make this thing called a frost flower. So when you have a frosty morning, 
these little ribbons of white frost come out of the stems and it's just one of those ephemeral things you've got to catch before the sun hits it, uh, but it's magic. Uh, we looked at goldenrods when I showed you an image in Columbia under a power line cut. Uh, the species that was blooming there was probably uh, Solidago canadensis, a horribly aggressive plant, wonderful on the side of the road, great for wasps and bees. Uh, there are good garden specimen uh, Solidago as well. And since we'd mentioned tea, uh, this anise scented goldenrod has leaves that smell like licorice. It's a, it was a once a very popular herbal tea, probably used in the old um, Liberty tea. Uh, mixtures after the Boston Tea Party um, and it was exported and it was a major export to China in the 1930s um, but makes a great garden plant as well stays put and it rarely seeds it's actually one of the few goldenrods that you would want to have seed in and it doesn't um, and then another one a, a gray goldenrod just a nice little clumper both of these are drylanders uh, so you wouldn't want lots and lots of water on them they would probably get too big and floppy that's one of the great things about so many natives. They're, they're durable. They're used to our summer droughts. You don't have to do as much. Um, and super dry ground, we do have one native cactus in the area, an Opuntia. And uh, it's got those little tiny glockids on the pads that are very uh, uncomfortable. Uh, in fact, some of the Opuntias, they used to be used mixed with talc for itching powders. Um, and I see after I've taught some of the kids in my neighborhood not to touch it, how they, they teach the other new little kids, you know, by, hey, touch that. <laughs> and the mom comes over and it's not good. Uh, but great plant. The fruit are actually edible as well. Um, and our grasses, you, could, you need a, a complete lecture on grasses. They're, they're so uh, varied uh, and American flora has so many grasses. Uh, probably the best one of all is Panicum brigatum, and luckily you can buy it in nurseries because the Europeans have loved it for so long. A lot of the cultivar selections were made initially in Germany, and so you'll see names like Rostralbusch and Hanse Hermes. Uh, even the more recent uh, cultivar Shenandoah is from Germany. Um, so they've valued it for a long time, and we're just starting to. Uh, it's a great grass. Uh, I have native forms from Montgomery County in the garden, but also cultivars, so you can see and make a, make a choice for yourself which type you like. Um, this one is actually from Montgomery County, and uh, it's, it was just naturally very upright and kind of formal. Um, they're great. They just happen to be larval hosts. A lot of people don't think about that, but the skippers, those cute little butterflies with lots of personality, that is their food plant, uh, any number of the grasses. Uh, they also just add winter interest because you can leave them up. In the fall, they sway in the, light, the lightest breeze, so they really add a lot of movement to the garden. A wonderful plant. And the one on the right there, I've been told that's bloodgrass. That's Shenandoah. Shenandoah. So that's the red, one of the reddest cultivars to come out to date. Uh, bloodgrass, uh, Imperata, is also called Kogon grass, and it's green form. It's a horrible invasive, uh, really, really serious invasive. Uh, forms like Red Baron are supposedly sterile, but I don't, I don't allow it at the garden at all. I'm just not comfortable with that. Uh, vines, uh, like I said before, our native vines uh, can be not so demure. They can sometimes be problematic in our, our new uh, cut up suburban landscapes. Uh, but one like Decomeria barbera, this is a, called wood vamp, is a southern vine. I think it's probably the closest thing I could tell someone uh, to replace ivy with. It can grow along the ground. Uh, it has hold tights much like ivy, so it can climb. Nice little hydrangea-like flowers in the summer that attract a lot of pollinators. The only thing I would say is it's not entirely evergreen, especially in a really cold winter, but, but nice and slow moving for a vine. Um, one I wouldn't recommend for your garden, I do see people doing it. Uh, I see in DC uh, someone trimming one every year and it's got a trunk you know, this big around. Uh, God bless them for <laughs> getting in there and cutting it as much as they have to. Uh, but it is a wonderful plant for hummingbirds. And so if you had land, uh, this is an oxen farm in Maryland, uh, if you had space to allow something like this to develop, the hummingbirds would love you. Uh, this is one I would be more likely to recommend. It's a, a little bit be better behaved, smaller scale plant, Bignonia capriolata. And it's available in the trade. There's a few nice cultivars of it that range from yellow to red. Uh, this is just a kind of a typical species form. Uh, it's nice because it holds fast very lightly. 
And so you can pull it down and remove it from where you don't want it, uh, cut it back after it blooms, and let the, the growth mature for next year. It is semi-evergreen, uh, sometimes fully evergreen. It's a very attractive vine. Uh, and a lot of people know about trumpet honeysuckle, Lanicera sempervirens, but there are other native honeysuckles uh, that are great, and they're just not grown well. Only a, a few nurseries I've ever seen offering this one. This one tends to bloom all at once. It makes a spectacle uh, for about three weeks. Um, Sempervirens is nice because it has a, a more extended bloom season, but all wonderful. And just be aware that uh, when it comes to native plants, the ones you see in the nursery are not it. Botanists know our native plants. Horticulturists, we're still only 50% you know, of the way there. Uh, and native wisteria. Uh, Asian wisteria has become really problematic. Um, I've seen along the Potomac River efforts to remove it. It tends to be an escape from older home sites. And it's uh, really a woody liana. It's huge. It's of the scale of a giant tropical vine. Our trees are not built for that. Our trees are built for things like Virginia creeper that are very lacy and light. They lose their leaves in the winter. And so all their stems that are up in the tree aren't holding winter ice and snow weight uh, so they don't tend to cause as much trouble. Um, so we recommend the native wisterias. I will tell you that botanists have merged what I would call two different native wisterias into one. They all re they're all recognized under that name wisteria frutescens. In the old days, we would have said there's a Kentucky wisteria also. That one is the one that there are most cultivars of. So find one like Longwood Purple or Blue Moon. Uh, those are of the Kentucky type. It's a larger vine. It can have long flower racemes, so a little bit more like the, the Asian types. It can be nice and lightly fragrant, uh, and it's an easy grower. And then there's the coastal plain form, and you can find one cultivar of it, I think, Amethyst Falls, which has gotten immensely popular. It has lots of little fat grape-like clusters of flowers, and it's at a much smaller scale, so it's really probably the best garden plant for, for urban gardeners. And I think if people would just make more selections of our native plants, someday there will be dwarfs. There will be highly fragrant forms. The fragrance is already there. No one's really selecting for it. Asians love their own plants. That's why you have so many versions of Japanese maple. Um, we have always loved our native landscapes, but we're just now looking at the individual items within it and appreciating them. And we do have really demure vines. This is a local vine, Clematis viorna, leather flower. And the, it's got that name because the flower really has thick, leathery petals. Uh, loved by bumblebees. They're the only thing strong enough to kind of pry it open and get up in there to get the nectar. Um, but only six to eight feet tall. Um, it dies back to the ground each year, so it's never going to overwhelm a space. And it, it sends up more and more stems each year. So grow it in a, in a tough shrub or on a, a lamppost or up you know, a, a rather short support. Uh, you'll have a great flowering in mid to late spring, and it's another one of those plants. It's probably built to withstand uh, predation by, by some kind of larvae. I've cut them back because in some cases they grew a little more than I wanted, and they came back with a second flush of bloom. So that I find is true of a lot of natives. They're built to withstand the rigors of a, a heavy feeding by, by the larvae of something, and then come back. Um, when it comes to shrubs, you're going to find a lot of cultivars there also, and the same rules apply. Now, a color leafed form of something like nine bark probably doesn't make any difference to a larva feeding on it. It still has the same kind of flowers as the green form. I really think that's probably fine. And uh, for the gardener who needs something purple, I'd rather have them choose a purple native plant than a purple non-native plant. Uh, when you're looking at that double flower thing again, you do have to think. Um, all the fancy forms of our, our native hydrangea, beautiful garden plants, and I would give you five points for planting a native shrub, but I might give you ten points if you planted the native form that doesn't have all those sterile florets on it. The sterile florets are pretty to us, but they come at the cost of the fertile flowers that, that have the pollen and nectar that insects need. So as a plant, it supports the, the hydrangea sphinx moth. It doesn't matter if it's double or single, but you get much more out of it if you'll go with the, the less fancy form. And I think a good, a good compromise is something like that, the mop head types. It's got a, enough show for, for my eyes and a lot to offer for pollinators. And even if you're not going to use all native plants, uh, I have a couple non-native plants in my yard. Um, the same rules. 
uh, if you're doing roses, remember about remember how long, far that insect has to reach in to get to the nectaries. Uh, if it's semi-double, they can still get in there. If it's fully double, really it's more just for your eyes, not, not serving the needs of, of something greater. Um, and you see there too, uh, oops, the bum bumblebee's waiting, uh, actually a little hoverfly waiting its turn. <laughs> uh, hoverflies, remember what do they eat? They're larvae? They eat aphids? You ever seen aphids on roses? Yes. <laughs> I, when I worked here, I remember Roger the Rosarian, we, we do, uh, I think, twice a week tank sprays for all the insects that, that get on roses. And so at the National Garden, and I think everywhere now, people are starting to look at growing roses that are naturally more disease resistant and, and growing them in more organic ways. And I think that's a great direction. Uh, terrific native shrub, Ceanothus, New Jersey tea. There are lots of beautiful blue Ceanothus out west in California and, and Mexico. Uh, but this is our eastern one, and it was used to make a really tasty tea. Actually, technically, it's a tisane, I guess, a herbal tea. Um, uh, heavily used after the American Revolution. Uh, still used by herbalists. Uh, makes a great tasting tea, but no caffeine, sorry. Uh, lots of tiny little white flowers. Again, as with the herbaceous plant, lots of little tiny white flowers bring lots of little tiny pollinators. And in this case, it's kind of an alternate hummingbird feeder. Uh, hummingbirds, like all birds, uh, eat insects. And so we think of hummingbirds as sipping nectar, but particularly when the females are nesting, she needs protein. Uh, and she'll come to a plant like this and pick off all the little gnats and midges that are, that are buzzing around those tiny flowers. So, 80% of the bird's diet, in most cases, are insects. Is that full sun? Full sun, part shade. This is a rare plant in, in that it grows in the mountains, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain. And so it's actually very tough. It likes well-drained ground. The only places I have, have seen it not do well are where it's mulched and watered too much. Again, another one that they should be making selections of because it's so variable in nature. And then you get the bonus of those nice reddish seed capsules after the flowers go. Uh, terrific heavy hitter uh, for moist gardens is the big cephalanthus occidentalis, the button bush. The biggest magnet for butterflies and bees that I've ever seen, well, there's one other southeastern plant, Cyrilla, that's equally as good, but uh, for a local native, you cannot go wrong with this. It doesn't have a huge, hugely long bloom season, but while it does bloom, the flowers are fascinating to look at. Uh, heavily visited. I, there were swallowtails literally battling it out over this one uh, along the Potomac River. It was kind of funny. Uh, it's also a larval host. It's a big plant. It can be about 12 by 12, but it blooms on new wood. So if you choose to, you can keep it cut down to a rather small and manageable shrub and, and still get the enjoyment. Uh, one great thing about native shrubs is they're the largest producers of berries, uh, which are not only beautiful to us, but nutritious for the birds. And this is a uh, one of, the gar one of the favorites of the public in the National Garden, uh, Viburnum nudum, uh, a locally native species. Favors wetlands, but is a good garden plant in just average soil. Uh, spectacular and native from Maryland's uh, eastern shore southward in the coastal plain, uh, but this one is actually amenable to clay soils as well, Calicarpa americana. There are Asian Calicarpas as well, uh, but this is our local form and it's just over the top crazy huge clusters of purple berries. Um, sometimes you can luck out and get a little bit of yellow fall color while the fruit are still on it, and that's the day to bring your camera out. And just so many others. The choke berries, which used to be called aronias, they're now lumped in with photinia. Uh, dogwood, uh, lindera, spicebush, which is the host for the spicebush swallowtail butterfly, uh, and so many native viburnums. Really nutritious fruit for those migrating birds and beautiful. And I think winterberry holly is probably a lot of people's favorite native shrub because the, those berries hang on through most of the winter, uh, very bright on those female plants. Um, and I was so delighted a few years ago when Doug Tallamy's book came out because I've always loved native plants and I try to convey to people why they're so important, but it, no one really had the numbers. But Doug Tallamy and his students started compiling how many insect interactions happen with certain plants. And I, I did a lecture at the same place he was lecturing, so I got to spend some time with him one day. You could just throw a name out, like, what about crepe myrtles? Three species. <laughs> what about, you know, the seven species? Uh, so he knows. 
uh, look, look at the, the native trees, the oaks at the top, 517 species of Lepidopterans supported by not one oak, but all the oak species in North America. Uh, willows, salix that are next, and black cherry, uh, prunus, and maple, birches, and on and down. You get to the perennials, the numbers aren't quite as stunning, but they're still pretty darn impressive. And it seems like asters, uh, solidago, a lot of the composites, a lot of the most common plants that you see in a flora, not coincidentally, are the big suppliers of food for insects. And Doug Tallamy's point in, in his book is, if you have the insects, you have the birds. This is what the birds need. Um, so make your garden count. If you can only have one or two trees in your yard, make it one of these heavy hitters. Uh, you'll be doing everyone a favor. I have, I've had to change my whole mindset. Uh, I look in the woods at this tilia, this American basswood, and I see all the holes in the leaves. I wanted to take a picture of the species for a slide, but I'm like, darn it, it's just get, it's so bug eaten. And then I, boom, it dawned on me. <laughs> That's a great plant. This is a plant we should be using along the street. Uh, at the garden, and so when we're pulling out our calorie pears, uh, we're probably going to be replacing with oaks and tilia and things like that. Once the, the leaf canopy is up high, who cares if insects are eating it? Is it really hurting anything? No. Uh, those are sawfly larvae on willows. This is along the Potomac River. Sawfly larvae, unlike caterpillars, don't have any protect, don't have any hair on them. They don't have any chemical defenses, so they all kind of feed together in lines. And then when a bird comes along, they all wiggle their tails in unison, thinking they're real scary. <laughs> now, you'll come back a week later, and they'll all be gone. The, these are candy to the birds. So uh, plant a willow. Uh, there's lots of, there are a lot of native trees that we can use just for beauty. They do so much more. Uh, Cornus florida, its foliage, when it breaks down in forest systems, is considered the most nutritious for the forest floor. It releases its nutrients. Uh, more readily than any other forest tree. So great plant for our eyes. The berries on it are great for birds. It just goes on and on. Wonderful tree. Don't give up on it because you've heard of uh, Discula anthracnose on them. That's more a problem in the mountains and cool areas. If grown in our warmer suburban areas, they don't seem to have much, much trouble. And there are resistant cultivars coming along. Uh, redbud, another common. That's a, a dry land native tree. Um, a lot of people will say, ah, I don't like that harsh magenta color. I think it's spectacular. I think if you combine that with sassafras, which has kind of a lime cadmium color flower at the same time, they're just wonderful together. Uh, but there are cultivars, and this is a case where a soft pink cultivar or a white cultivar might be what it takes to get someone to put it in their yard. Uh, just FYI, if you've never eaten uh, uh, the flower of redbud, it's by far the best tasting edible flower. So strip some off and pop them in your mouth, throw them on your salad or whatever, kind of lemony, nutty flavor, really nice. Uh, pawpaw gets a lot of attention. Uh, this is one native tree I don't have to worry about too much because it's one of the few trees in the woods that deer do not eat. Its leaves are toxic to mammals. The fruit is fine and quite nutritious and tasty for mammals and for us, including us. Um, uh, but it is the sole larval host in our area, I think, for the uh, zebra swallowtail. Not the tiger, but the zebra swallowtail. And you'll see a, a white and black barred zebra swallowtail kind of floating over pawpaws in the woods. Uh, the female is very closely looking over each plant to put her egg on one that hasn't been uh, uh, found by another female. And the reason for that is they not only eat leaves, but they're, they're cannibals. So she's pretty smart. She's not having trouble making up her mind. She's really checking that tree out. Um, and you hear about people feeding butterflies by smashing bananas and fruit and putting them out on bowls. Uh, that was happening with native pawpaws in the woods, you know, eons before uh, that idea went into the books. Uh, an unsung hero, little native tree. It's kind of spotty in this area, but I think it is present in Montgomery County in rocky areas, especially where there's any kind of lime bearing stone. Uh, Telia trifoliata the wafer ash or hop tree. It got those common names because it was used as a, a substitute for bittering beer. So it was a hops substitute in colonial days. It's actually in the citrus family. And the citrus faces one native insect in the south. Uh, farmers don't like it much. They call the, the caterpillar an orange dog. Uh, but it's the giant swallowtail. And so I plant things like this. We're at the northern edge of the giant swallowtail's range. but. Um, 
usually if you plant a few wafer ash, you'll, you'll have a population of that. And they're great, the giant caterpillars that look like, like a big bird poop. So that's their, that's their mechanism for not being eaten by birds. Um, but this tree grows wet or dry, sun or shade, sand, clay, acid, alkaline. It takes different forms all around the country. In Texas, it's a little shrub and hard scrabble environments. I've seen it at the Montreal Botanic Gardens as a specimen. Uh, so fantastic tree you can't buy at Benke's or Maryfield or anywhere else. I, I don't know why. Transplants just fine. Um, Ostraya virginiana is making a little bit of a comeback in urban forest ecology. It's a wonderful birch relative, so it probably feeds lots of insects. It was not favored for a while because we used de-icing salts for our, our winter sidewalks and streets, and it, it's salt intolerant. But now people have made the switch over to things like calcium chloride, uh, different safer salts, and so we can bring this tree back into the city. Uh, and it's a great scale. Uh, Sternberg and Wilson's book said, you know, not everything can be purple or yellow or spectacular, uh, giant flowers. Sometimes you need a quiet background plant, and this is one such tree. Really nice, the, the hop-like fruit, just elegant. Uh, it's a nice texture. Give it a try. Uh, Juniperus virginiana, kind of an aggressive plant. When you, whenever you see cleared farm fields, it, it comes in rather quickly. And I like it, I, I hear people describe it as a, like people at a bus stop. There's fat ones, there's skinny ones, there's short ones, there's different color forms. Uh, so it's real variable. The fruit are indeed eaten by cedar waxwing birds, so great for them. Um, and if you want to bring a cultivated form in, like a, a weeping form for some character in your garden, there are native plants to do it. You just have to look a little bit harder. Uh, and anything that you plant, even if it's not specialized at feeding something, almost every native plant is eaten by the generalists. There are all these caterpillars that are called generalists. They, this caterpillar, the smartweed caterpillar, of course it eats smartweed, uh, but it also eats birch trees, cherry trees, grasses, anything. Here it's eating an aquatic plant in the National Garden. It's a beautiful caterpillar, and it makes one of those kind of anonymous brown moths. Those are great bird food. So all the little tiny moths you see around, they, they need our help too, because they're, they're going on to feed more and more things down the line. In fact, this caterpillar uh, will eat anything in marsh habitats, including a plant that's supposed to eat insects. <laughs> so, uh, fall color is your bonus when you plant native woody plants, but also a few perennials, you get fall color. Fall color is really only prevalent in two areas of the world, Eastern North America and East Asia. And that's why our woody plants are popular worldwide. So great bonus, good combinations with our, our native colors and textures. Uh, wonderful things like this in the National Garden as late as November. Uh, great native grass along with a native sunflower. Uh, and you can see our garden just starts coloring up uh, that's late summer, early fall, and then probably by uh, October, it's just wonderful. So come out and visit. And that concludes the lecture portion. <laughs> I, I've, heard a, I've heard the suggestion of uh, uh, wire caging. <laughs> Rabbits are, rabbits, they will eat native and non-native plants. It doesn't seem to make much difference. We even have them at our nursery in DC and they're a problem for us too. So we've fenced off certain areas, especially with, with seedlings. Um, but I'm not really the, the best person to tell you how to control animals. Uh, again, I think with deer, and I'm not an expert on that at all, the, their tastes change all the time. So I'll, I'll contact my friend Tammy out at a garden. She'll say, we're planting tons of euphorbias because the deer are coming. And then two years later, the young started eating euphorbias this year. And now they're, they're, they're food for them. That's tough. And there are, uh, you know, I look at invasive uh, burning bush, Euonymus salata in the woods. There's a difference. Deer don't eat that one. They love our native one, the strawberry bush. Um, mm -hmm. That the, the, deer, the deer are helping it. Yeah, they're selecting around it. So that's one of the reasons. That's not the only reason it's invasive.
Yes and no. No. I guarantee you the, the Paracas sander that you look at that's evergreen is Asian. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I've talked to people who have IV problems and I have a neighbor and he said, you know what, after listening to you and seeing your crew work on and, and pulling invasive plants, I'm not going to plant ivy after all. I think I'll do Pachysandra. Like, well, no. <laughs> okay, Pachysandra won't climb a tree. So it's not the worst plant in the world. It's not giving back uh, to nature at all because nothing really eats it, but that's again why it's popular because it, it's clean. I would say it's better than ivy, uh, but keep it controlled. If you happen to live in a, a, a housing that butts, abuts a woodland, keep it well away. It's like Vinca Minor, it will uh, vegetatively just keep going and going. Uh, ultimately, it would be pretty controllable if we set our mind to it, but um, well, there, there is a native pack of Sandra, too. I've taken it up mm -hmm. and it keeps coming back. I don't want it. Oh, good for you. All right. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you these roundup. <laughs> uh, well, good for you. Uh, but there actually is a native Pachysandra, and just like Lily of the Valley, the European Lily of the Valley is kind of invasive here, but there's also a, an Appalachian counterpart to it that's native. And our native Pachysandra is a beautiful plant. It's not fully evergreen, but the leaves are kind of gray-green with very silver marking on the top, and wonderful stacked white inflorescences, white flowers in the spring. So I think it's by far a prettier plant, but it's a more relaxed looking plant, and some people don't want that. No, it's just that it's a non-native plant, and it is, you know, compared to ivy, it's not horribly invasive, but it is mildly invasive. And that's something that you'll see uh, persistent at old home sites uh, and just sort of creeping in. I also see the other vinca that used to be used in window boxes, the real uh, variegated usually. Uh, that one also is a, an invasive problem, more so to our south. That's a lot of work. Wow. What have you replaced it with? Well, I tried to Lots of things or? Shrubs, Good. Um, but some yeah. Grass, mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had Oh, you mean like cottonwood, the ones that make all that yeah. fuzz in the spring? It's a high larval host plant. It's yeah, a good plant. <laughs> yeah, those riverine plants, and I grew up in a neighborhood in Silver Spring that was dominated by silver maples. Those lowland trees uh, and a lot of willows, they're meant to live in areas that get scoured by floods every now and then, and so the tree may not make it in nature more than 30 years, so it's got to set up a lot of seed production early, and they do. Yeah. But they also happen to be really, really good larval hosts. It's probably not the only thing, but the only, maybe the only thing available to you. Yeah. But it's, it's a problem of availability. I mean, uh, yeah, I share some of the plants out of my yard with my neighbors because I could tell them what it is, but they can't find it anywhere. You know, and that, that's a real shame. Yeah, I mean, when, I do, when I do a lecture uh, not representing the botanic garden, I'll often include sources of native plants, but we, we don't like to officially endorse companies. But uh, I, I can send you a list of some sources that I like uh, by email or something. But they're almost all mail order sources. The nice thing about uh, the era right now versus uh, 15 years ago is you can Google. So if you Google the, the Latin plant name and the word nursery, you'll often get some hits on companies that do sell some neat things. And you'll, you'll see a lot of plants listed you've never heard of. Yeah, I've been doing that, but sometimes I get a plant that I never mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I've been known to go to a nursery manager with a you know, yellow iris pseudocorus in my hand and say, you've got to change the sign. You shouldn't even be selling it. But, you know. Uh, and it, it's not always that they're unscrupulous. They're passing something along that they've heard somewhere else or seen somewhere else. And uh, I haven't really seen anything like a deliberate deception. It's just a lack of knowledge. So is there a good source to really see good pictures and names that you can tell when you're getting? 
Uh, wow, there's. I've got some sources, Yeah, and even even the USDA plants website, some of the photos aren't terrific because they started accepting photos many years ago, and now the the standards are higher and higher for resolution, but. Uh, I, I tell you what, uh, there's a guy who runs two websites, uh, Alabama Plants and Missouri Plants .com. Uh, He is an excellent photographer. I've used his sites many times because a lot of the a lot of the flora that exists here in the Mid-Atlantic also, especially, comes into Missouri. Um, so often, when I'm googling a plant, I'll come to his website, and I've even asked him to, to borrow. I borrowed photos from him because they're just so great. Show you little stem pieces, the base of the leaf. You know, lots of detail. Uh, but for me, uh, like when I was specking the National Garden, I, I read really geeky flora. Like I'll read a flora of a region, and it's all these keys. That, you know, it's nothing but words and a few little diagrams and really not, uh, you know, bedside reading. Although I have one next to my bed. <laughs> uh, just love to key something out before I go to sleep. <laughs> Okay. Because um, I've been in some discussions where um, we talk about whether or not that is a true native, and mm -hmm. some of them actually don't carry the benefits of um, the actual original native. Yeah, a, lo a lot of uh, native plant people have a sort of inborn prejudice against cultivars uh, because the term cultivar was classically meant to be something that arose in cultivation. So let's say you were growing a, a, a bunch of seeds of dogwood uh, in cultivation. One came up and it has yellow fruit instead of red fruit and you want to market it. You give it a cultivar name so that you can communicate to the buyer that it's this special plant and it has this special character. Really in the native plant game there was no other method so people would wild collect plants uh, that were a little bit aberrant or uh, had some positive quality and assign it a cultivar name even though it was wild collected. Uh, so there have been words like ecovar proposed for some of those. So I do a little research. I can tell you that uh, you know, Phlox de Vericata London Grove uh, came from Pennsylvania. It came from a Quaker community and so it was probably locally collected and it's a very good form. If you buy an unnamed form at the nursery, it could come from Texas, it could come from uh, Minnesota, so you really know less about it. So I, I find that as long as there's some information on where the cultivar came from, it can be really helpful. And so I don't discriminate against them. Uh, in the National Garden, in fact, I tried to bring in some forms of native conifers, like we have um, uh, Chemicipris thioides, which is Atlantic white cedar, nice wetland tree. The French long ago had selected little tiny dwarf forms that are really tight, and now the Dutch have too. So I put some in the, in the garden, and for me, it just didn't look right, because really, with all the other kind of loose native plants, it just looked stiff and out of place. When I moved it to a place where it flanked a pathway to a formal garden feature, it's perfect. So in that case, the cultivar fits the place. Um, it serves many of the same roles, whether what, depending on its form, but um, I, I'm not really against cultivars. When you look at Echinacea, uh, you're told that Echinacea purpurea is native. If you really look into it, it may be native to parts of western North Carolina and some ancient relic prairies in the western part of the Mid-Atlantic, but it's really not locally native. The only one that was locally native was Echinacea levigata. We have a nice population in the National Garden. It's extinct in Pennsylvania and Maryland. It exists still from Virginia to Georgia, and it was the only Piedmont native and one reason native plant people get really worked up is that the purpurea form is escaping our gardens and where it meets levigata, it tends to overpower it. So genetically, what should be a smooth, shiny-leafed echinacea that's distinctive gets hairy leaves because it's now hybridized with a western native. So it gets complicated. <laughs> so not to scare you off with the cultivars, but that's, that's, those are reasons for the different controversies, so it does take a little research. Well, isn't the term variety mean it's natural? It was found in the lake, but not in Yeah. In, in, in Latin binomials, uh, there are different levels below species rank. 
variety being one, subspecies being another, um, so forma you, being another. Could, you, could that help her to know that if it's not, if it's closer to what's happening in the real world? <laughs> well, I, I would say like during the lecture, if you looked at the uh, butterfly weed, the Sclepius tuberosus, there are six native uh, subspecies or variants of it that are, that are recognized taxonomically. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference between them when you go to the nursery and see that beautiful orange flowering plant. Uh, it's, they're pretty subtle distinctions and again it gets down, it gets down to those plant keys. Um, for, for me, I was happy to have the Anne Arundel County, uh, a donation of germplasm from Anne Arundel County for the swamp milkweed. Uh, we grew it, it had broad fuzzy leaves, so I knew it was actually the local type. It is a specific type to the Mid-Atlantic. I don't think it makes much difference to monarch butterflies, uh, but there may be a subtle difference. There may be a local preference for it, so why not try? This has turned out to be a really great form, too, and it blooms and blooms. So. Uh, Yes. Gooseneck uh, loosestrife, right? Uh, maybe. No. No. Uh, gooseneck loosestrife is a lythrum, so it's related to that purple loosestrife. And it's one of those plants whose genus spans the globe. Um, I, I, probably only in the northern hemisphere, but there are European, Asian, and uh, North American uh, loosestrifes. Um, many of them, both native or non native, are pretty aggressive plants. I think that's a pretty aggressive spreader. I don't think it's considered noxious anywhere, but uh, it is not native. It is often sold for woodland gardens under that sort of uh, potential that it, it seems like it, it fits in with our native flora, but uh, a wetland plant that I would say would be a good alternative would be uh, lizard's tail, Sororus cernuus. It makes beautiful white sort of gooseneck flowers on wet ground and it likes shade or part sun. Well, yeah, inkberry holly is one of those native success stories in the nursery industry because it's really easy to root cuttings of it. And now there are some nicer, nicer forms of it that hold their foliage better. So it is a good foundation shrub, but I see it planted in the most horrible, dry uh, traffic islands and such. It's a wetland plant. It's native from Nova Scotia down the coast, and it grows in wetlands. It's amazing enough that it does so well in an average garden, average garden soil. Um, but uh, I'm, a, I'm in zone 8-2 where I live, so I've actually moved a little further south sometimes in my plant taste. And for a holly, for instance, I use Ilex vomitoria, uh, which is Yopon holly, a common foundation shrub in the south. Uh, I grew up here in Maryland being taught that it wasn't hardy, and then we'd take field trips to the arboretum, and they had <laughs> trees with trunks this big of that species, and I thought, hmm, <laughs> something's not right here. Well, it doesn't like bitter cold winter wind, and so I wouldn't put it in an exposed garden in Gaithersburg, but maybe in a courtyard garden in Bethesda, it'd be great. Uh, yeah, native evergreens, are that's a really tough one because we have the native American holly uh, and uh, some rhododendrons and not a whole lot else. Yeah, so learn to love deciduous. You see more seasonal change that way. <laughs> I grow Carolina laurel cherry too. That's another one that's, I think it's native from Virginia southward, but it's evergreen and quite handsome. It can be tree size or shrub size. Uh, winter berry holly? Yeah. I, I, you can't go wrong with that. So it's just spectacular. Good choice. What about wineberry? Um, oh, the, the rubus? R rubus fina calaisius? I never heard of it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it looks like a, a raspberry, but it has like really bright red hairy stems. It's, it's tough because it, it moves underground like a lot of the brambles, like a lot of our native brambles. Uh, so as with something like bamboo, you can either repeatedly cut the vegetation that comes up to weaken it to the point of decline uh, or do the bad and uh, hit it with something. I would, I would say uh, for something like that, um, something like um, garlon, which contains triclopyr, which you can just paint on a stem so you're not spraying a big vast area. If you do that, it will take it down and kill that plant and the roots and not impact all the other things around it. And that's te that tends to be what 
um, foresters use against their um, weedy, woody plants in general. I think Brush Be Gone contains the same chemical. And some people will say you can take Roundup and use it at concentrate and paint it on cut areas and it'll do the same thing. Um, but I, I pull them up. They, they're not that hard to pull up. Yeah, uh, on sandy loam or, you know. Yeah. Have you eaten them? They're not too bad. They're, they're, they're not bad. Someone, someone picked, me, picked me a bunch one day, like a gift. I'm like, ah, where'd you go? Where were these growing, you know? They tasted okay. Not as good as our native blackberry, though. Yeah, I mean, you can keep mowing it short. It tends to, it tends to make such solid areas you can, you can use the lawnmower to prevent it from flowering. Yeah, now you have wavy leaf basket grass too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, in the, the woods where I work, we have only a little bit of it, so we've just been hand pulling it. In places I showed you, like Oxen Cove, where it's taken uh, acreages, again, you're, 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 it's too grand of a scale to pull by hand. No one's going to do it. No one's going to no one's going to say tax me more so we can send an army in there to get rid of it. Uh, so probably again it's going to come down to a well-timed spray or something like that. Um, when I work I talked to Jill, Jill Swearingen at uh, Rock Creek about invasive control in Rock Creek, uh, they did several different studies and those woods were so heavily infested with non-natives that they found that they could do a broadcast spray once and not touch a single native plant. They didn't kill anything native. The only native things they might hit would be Smilax, um, the cat briar, which seemed to be okay with coming right back. Um, so. Well, plus you're, you're going to deal with you know, seed banking issues. This is one reason you know, we don't like something like mimosa, uh, because it seeds can live within the seed bank for many, many years, maybe even decades, and keep coming up as long as, as long as conditions are right. And for those grasses, it could be just a little bit of disturbance of the soil, bringing the grass seed into the light where, where it can germinate. A lot of our native plants' uh, germination strategies are based on having some leaf litter cover over them, and so they're dark germinators. When you expose them to light, they're exposed to predation, and it also ruins them for germination. The opposite is true of a lot of weedy plants, a lot of uh, grasses and composites. So they need that light to germinate, and as long as you're, you're pulling and tilling and doing whatnot, you're just exposing a f you know, that many more seeds. So, good luck. Yeah. I, I guess persistence is going to be the key. Yeah, yeah, well, keep, keep working. <laughs> um, yeah. When was the timing of that spray in Rock Creek that they said? I, I wish I could remember. Uh, Susan Sammons and Jill Swear, they're both still there uh, as far as I know. Uh, but it, it was probably growing. Prime, growing, prime growing season, maybe a little late. Uh, once things like porcelain berry had really covered the non natives, the, the natives. We're good? All right, thanks so much. Thanks.